Ja? Oké. Okay. So, um, uh, welcome to you, Mr. John James. Um, I think it's very important uh, that we will hear your uh, opinion about the quantity of medical errors and also the uh, consequences of medical errors. Um, I've read your article which you published recently in um, the Journal of uh, Patient Safety. And um, could you expand a little bit about uh, the uh, uh, global trigger tool which you have used? The studies that I used to do the review uh, used primarily the global trigger tool to identify possible adverse events and then doctors looked at those potential adverse events and decided if they were uh, preventable or not or if they were sort of a natural course of, of competent medical care. Uh, but the global trigger tool itself is very good at sort of combing through medical records and finding uh, identifiers that suggest that something has gone wrong. And what were your conclusions about um, uh, the quantity of medical errors compared oh, yeah. to the IOM uh, report of um, 2000? Yes. Well, the IOM in 2000 published an estimate that up to 98,000 people uh, uh, suffer from lethal medical errors every year in the United States. My estimate was more than four times that. Uh, the reasons for that are probably that I looked at errors of omission, that is when something could have been done and wasn't to save the patient's life. I also consider diagnostic errors uh, and errors of context where um, the patient was expected to do things that it was obvious they could not do, like take medications after they're discharged or something of that sort. I also went into a, a rather um, difficult area for the system to deal with, that is that medical records don't always reflect what truly happened. And I'll leave it at that, and one can figure out why that might be. Yes, uh, but you came to a very shocking conclusion about uh, the quantity of medical errors. Uh, I think it is. In, in my country, about 2.4 million people die every year. And so 440,000 is about one-sixth of the deaths in my country. Uh, can be associated with something that went wrong in, in medicine that should not have. And uh, uh, rated in comparison to uh, other um, causes of death in the United States? Roughly 30,000 people die in car accidents every year. Uh, so it's ten times higher than that. The multitude. And uh, um, did you also um, uh, compare it to, uh, let's say, death by cancer or by heart disease? or? Um, I, I didn't actually my article, but heart disease is the, the highest killer. It's probably 550, 600,000, I think, and, and cancer's a little less, uh, around 500,000, 450, something like that. Mm -hmm. I see. That's a, um, now, as a coincidence, um, at the beginning of this week, um, the third uh, Dutch report on the quantity of medical errors um, in Holland was published, and uh, to our surprise, it concluded that uh, there's a major reduction in avoidable death, uh, 50 by 50 percent, and also in uh, avoidable harm by 45 percent, but they did not use the global trigger tool. What's your opinion about that? <laughs> well, I haven't read the study, but based on what you've just told me, uh, it really matters how you look for the errors. And as far as I know, the global trigger tool is, is sort of the gold standard of searching for these things. So I would, I would be hesitant to believe too much um, if they haven't used that or an equivalent tool to find the errors. I see. Um, do you have any idea uh, about the quantity of errors by GPs? Mm -hmm. That's a different story. I, I have ideas. I, I think GPs tend to make, general practitioners tend to make diagnostic errors. They, they, they miss things uh, that they, they should have because they're, they're seeing a lot of patients and to have a really good general knowledge of medicine is not easy and, and you really have to know when a patient is different from anything you've seen and then select the right specialist to send them to. But I think specialists make a, a huge number of medical errors too. Um, sometimes because the cases are very complex, um, sometimes because they're in too big a hurry and other times, to put it bluntly, they don't know what they're doing. Um, what's your opinion? How can we get a more precise view of the quantity of errors? 
I think. So I know there's some expansion going on uh, with the Global Trigger Tool. It's, it's from the Institute of Healthcare uh, Improvement, IHI. And I've read that they're expanding it and they're trying to develop better ways to have it find medical errors. I think it's going to be hard for them to, for example, ever be able to find errors of omission because that would require the tool to know the guidelines and so on. Uh, diagnostic errors are another thing. Those are not easy to find with a, a search tool. Um, but some of the physicians in my country, the United States, are paying a lot more attention to diagnostic errors. In fact, there's a new journal just starting within the last month called Diagnosis, and it is meant to uh, highlight the risk of, of diagnostic errors that hurt a lot of people. Yeah, so it might be important to, to read it properly by the internet. Yes, and, and there's, there's a lot of ways to kind of begin to get a handle on, on the true number of errors. Um, I tried to do that with my estimates in my article, but, but there's still a, much refinement to yeah. be done. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, um, I read on your website also that you were told by a past president of the American Board of Medical Specialties that patients know no more than 1% of the medical errors that happen to them. Um, so victims are hardly informed about medical errors, the so-called wall of silence, which you also refer to in your book. Um, are you aware that um, as a victim of a medical error does not get hardly get any honest information that he or she also has hardly any access to remedial medical care? Are you aware of that? I am not aware of that in my country. Um, but you were aware of uh, the existence of the wall of silence? Oh, absolutely. Because, and, and that means that, you know, sort of like <laughs> when people go on vacation, let's say in Las Vegas, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Well, okay, so the healthcare system is what happens in the hospital stays in the hospital. You, you don't tell what went on uh, because it's embarrassing in some cases. Uh, maybe that's getting freed up a little bit, but. It, by and large, there's still a lot of lack of transparency into what goes on, and that's why patients don't know about the harm that was, is done to them. Do you have any um, ideas how to change that? Um, well, I've proposed a Bill of Rights um, for patients that would give them a, a more level playing field when it comes to interacting with hospitals and, and with physicians in general, and, and the healthcare industry. Um, you know, are, are the drugs I'm taking safe for me? Do they interact with each other? Is anybody going to tell me that? Um, you, there's just a lot of things you need to know in a, uh, that you don't know. So a Bill of Rights that really uh, gives you some strength would be valuable. And, and something we talked about just a little bit ago, uh, a 360-degree review uh, as part of the peer review in hospitals would be very strong. That means that subordinates, colleagues, and uh, supervisors evaluate the medical personnel in a hospital anonymously and it can become very clear to the administration if he's got a problem with one of the physicians or nurses or pharmacists perhaps who's abusive, reckless, harms patients and nobody wants to tell it. But if they can do it anonymously and they can go fix this person's behavior, it's a good thing. And it does give improvements. It, it can. It, the initial intent is to improve the behavior of the person. Frankly, just knowing that your colleagues and your subordinates may be the ones asked to evaluate your performance would go a long ways to improving performance right away. Yeah, I understand. Um, my last question, do you have any suggestions for patients in Holland? Oh, Sophie, I, <laughs> I only know a little bit about Holland. Um, but for patients in general then? Because they're very vulnerable. Step one, do everything you can to stay out of hospitals. Stay healthy. Stay healthy. Whatever you do, stay healthy. Two, when you go in, take somebody who's assertive and fairly knowledgeable to help you run the gauntlet so that you have the best possible chance of coming out alive. Uh, if you can do it yourself, fine. But if you're, you know, you're vulnerable and you may be very sick and not capable of doing it. So, uh, but be armed, so to speak, when you go into the hospital. Yeah. Uh, we have a thing in, uh, in Holland, um, to have confidence is okay, but it's better to, uh, to check. Yeah, yeah, yeah we, we call it trust, uh, trust but verify. Yes, yes.
as well. I think um, it has been very uh, important to, uh, to meet you and uh, we wish you a lot of success with your campaign for patient safety. Well, I wish you every success. You, your voice is, uh, I think, heard pretty clearly in this, this wonderful little country and, and I hope you can, you can realize your dream of, of really getting safer care in this country. So, I wish you well. Thank you very much. Thank you.